Right on. Well, welcome everyone um, to another session, uh, Saturday session. Always appreciate uh, you joining us. And um, I think definitely lots going on. It's a long weekend in Canada and um, pretty interesting market action. Say that every week for the last three months, it seems like. Um, so keeping us on our toes and, and uh, making sure we're not slacking. A um, couple of things before we start. Um, I'm not an investment advisor, so please do your own due diligence. Please uh, check your own portfolio construction, your own risk tolerance. Um, some of the equities mentioned here are in the energy space, very volatile um, space, commodities in general, um, ups and downs. So, so please make sure you have conviction in what you're buying and um, understand the risk and the upside, downside, whatever that goes with it. Um, you know, it's uh, especially last week, after last Monday and Tuesday, I got a lot of messages, a lot of phone calls from, from people who had bought stocks and then they sold them right away. So, you know, this is an industry where we, we, we do see drawdowns and um, the overall fundamentals are still looking good um, from my opinion anyways, but you know, sometimes the short-term movements of the market can dictate what's going on with these um, with these equities. Um, the other thing is this valuation method that I'm going to be using today. I have the results of it for 56 or 57 companies. 56 now, I think, with Lucrata bought out um, on the website. It's been updated for Q1 results. There's about five companies that I'm missing, which are releasing late, but. The, the rest of them have been updated to Q1 results. Not, not really much changes, but there are some companies where because the Q1 hedges um, have come off the next 12 months forecast, the, the free cash flow does change. Um, there's inflection points in there, and I think we'll see the same thing after June 30th. So I am watching those companies. Um, some of them are in my portfolio, as you know. So, um, you know, for sure, check that out. And um, the other thing we have here is the uh, the website. So we have the latest corporate presentations. This Excel file slash Google Sheets is also available on the website for anyone that wants to follow along. If you go to whitetundra.ca, the homepage, all the way at the bottom under files, this exact file is in its Excel format. Uh, for you to follow along. I did make some changes to the file and the price targets. So everything is now automated. So it updates real time with the exchange rates, with the price of oil, with the price of gas, price of European TTF. The spreadsheet will live update the strip values and, uh, and the price targets. So um, I'm glad I was able to be smart enough to get that working because the coding is not my forte by any means. Um, but yeah, we'll get started. Um, for anyone that maybe thinks I'm going through this a bit too fast here as we go, the exact same reasoning and the exact same format is on the previous videos. We've covered probably 40 companies by now. So, you know, if something doesn't make sense or I'm, I'm rushing through it from, for the sake of time, please check out the previous videos and they have them in there too. Um, bit of a low schedule here for the next couple of weeks after this um, until June 11th, I believe. We got a couple of due diligence um, seminars coming up and then followed by the long awaited, um, what was called the North American oil markets. Um, Cause I do wanna talk about the different basins, the different uh, reservoirs and fields out there. And I've also got some feedback on, on people wanna hear some more about options. So. Um, that's scheduled for June 19th here, but um, yeah, for now, we'll get started on this. For anyone that's been through one of these before, it's gonna be very similar. Not much has changed in my, in my valuation model. For anyone that's attending who is a, in the finance space, you might find some of the, some of the metrics are not 100% exactly what maybe you're used to in your work or in your other um, methods, but the point here is to be a relative valuation tool. We are trying to compare 
50 companies in oil and gas, you might be using this for mining where you're comparing 500 companies. And we can't get caught up in things that make 1% difference or half a percent difference at the end of it all. So please keep that in mind. Um, this is a relative valuation tool. If the company does not generate cash flow, why bother wasting time figuring out if the 1% change in hedging or the 1% change in something makes a difference because it's not generating cash flow. So it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, just keep that in mind. I did get a couple messages regarding that. So uh, for sure. Okay, so we'll get started. So we'll be covering Advantage, uh, Crew, and Kelt today. Three Monty players in different different areas of their growth profile. We see a lot of these Monty players in the 25 to 75,000 BOEs range. Um, the Monty is a prolific reservoir. It's a prolific acreage. So you know, why not? But we do see that the Montney is going to become more and more in play here as LNG Canada comes closer to startup. We see companies making contracts with LNG companies down in the States. So there's going to be this, this movement towards bigger and bigger companies, in my opinion. And a lot of them, a lot of these companies that I discussed today may, may just be bought out in the next 12 months anyway, um, just in the, in the, uh, goal towards efficiencies, towards scale, towards just getting bigger. So you can have these contracts, you can have these long-term supply deals, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, but I'll talk about that later. So we'll get started with Advantage. So pretty simple spreadsheet here. Um, I'll just walk, walk us through it, um, kind of how I do it. And something I do want to say, this, this spreadsheet is fully flexible. So if you don't agree with my way of doing things, um, you know, feel free to put your own numbers in here based on whatever metric you think um, you think is important. So, so it is kind of built that way for it to be flexible as we go. Um, okay, so the first thing we need is the production. So um, basically I go to the MDNA, so Q1 reports. Um, a lot of them are, are getting built better and better I'm finding all the relevant information right on the front page here. So right there, total production, five, two, nine, four, six. So I'm just gonna put that in there, five, two, nine, four, six. And we also need to break this down because oil sells at a different price than gas, than NGL. NGL being natural gas liquids, so your propanes and your butanes. So, um, you know, we're gonna break this down here and thankfully the company does that for us. So we have crude oil and condensate, both of which classify under light oil. Um, most of the oil in the Montney all of the oil in the Montney is going to be classified as condensate or light oil. So we're going to add these two up. Um, that's going to give us 2054 for our light oil production. Again, I just added this number and this number. Um, the NGL, copy it right off, 2854, 2854. And we need a liquids percentage for the rest of the gas to go in there. So. The way I would calculate it, I would just take the sum of these two, so 4908 right there, um, and just put it in as a liquid percentage to our overall production. So about 9.3% of this production is liquids. If you do it manually, you just add these two and divide by your total production, end up at 9%. And that fills in the gas box for us, the gas production in, in BOEs. Um, Per day. The next thing we need is our shares outstanding. So we'll look up here. Most of the information we need, we can find in the um, MDNA or the interim report. A lot of companies have it um, differently. So right here. Um, I'd like to use March 31st numbers, but since they've given us a more updated number, um, that's what I'm gonna put in. So 189.8 million. So 189.8. For anyone using the spreadsheet, keep in mind the units. Everything has to go in based on the units because it's just adjusted accordingly as we go. So um, I know I've got a couple of messages that, that the spreadsheet has been messed up. 
but please keep in mind the, the units that we're going to be using. Um, and then the share price. So we need the last closing share price, which, oops. Uh, so 9.99 on Friday's close into the long weekend. So we're going to put that in there. Um, oops. The latest, the latest version of the spreadsheet I'm going to be putting out here in the next couple of weeks, it actually auto, auto fills all this in. Um, but I just don't like using that and just automating everything because what's the point of the seminar then? Um, you know, people can just put in numbers as is, uh, or sorry, the computer can just put it in and, and spit values out, but that's not really what builds conviction or, or understanding. So if you'll see the rest of my kind of uh, spreadsheet, everything here is automated now. Um, so I will share this, but I am a little wary um, of that. Anyway, um, so the next thing we need is the net debt. So the net debt I, I think is on the first page, yeah, right there. So 137 million. Again, we're just gonna put that in there. Um, so the spreadsheet fills out the white boxes. We have to put in the yellow boxes and They've given us three values here now. So the first one is market cap. So market cap tells us what's the value of all the company's shares combined. So you just take your number of shares outstanding, multiplied by the share price, we end up with the value of the shares outstanding. To that, we add the debt and we get our enterprise value. The enterprise value being what is the company worth as a whole. So if somebody wants to come and say, what is Advantage Energy worth today? That's what the market is valuing it at 2.03 uh, billion. So, you know, just, just metrics to keep in mind as you do these, as you do more of them, um, you know, it's good to learn these, these metrics and financial tools and whatnot. Um, the next thing we have is a debt to EV ratio. So 0.07, that tells me that 7% of the company's enterprise value is in debt. Um, what's the right number? I can't answer that for you. It's, it, it's going to be subjective. If, um, if someone is more interested in a high risk, high torque company, um, you think the commodity price environment is gonna be rising or stable where it is, maybe you want a higher debted company because that means the, sh the shares are more, more torquey. Um, if you're maybe new to the sector and you just want something safe, no bankruptcy risk, um, you know you want you want lower companies with with lower debt to EV, so that we're we're not running into issues with lines of credits with our um, our term debt coming due, you know, etc. So just something to keep in mind. If you're going to be doing 10, 20, 30, 40 of these, it, it becomes a relative valuation, um, a relative metric to compare between different sheets and different companies. Um, the next thing we need is the dividend. So Advantage doesn't pay a dividend, so zero. Um, if they did pay a dividend, we would just put it in there. Again, watch the units, um, dollars Canadian per share annually. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> perfect. So the next two things we need are adjusted funds flow and free cash flow. So what do these mean? Adjusted funds flow is how much money did the company make after every single expense? So operating costs, uh, transportation, um, royalties, the fuel that goes in the company operators trucks, the, all the stuff on site and the office, et cetera. What did the company actually generate after all that? That's known as adjusted funds flow. Some companies call it just funds flow, but look for adjusted funds flow if possible. And then, we have free cash flow. The difference between these two is that oil and gas production declines. If you have a well, if you have a, a battery, a facility, the production declines, um, just natural declines as pressure comes down in the reservoir, as the wells get older, the production declines. So above and beyond our adjusted funds flow, we need to spend money to keep our production flat or grow production. Um, if that's the goal of the company, but but most companies at least want their production held flat, if not a small growth wedge in there. So adjusted fund flow tells us the money 
that the company made after all expenses. The free cash flow tells us after all the expenses and keeping production flat. So all the drilling, completions, um, facilities, et cetera, to keep production flat. So we'll look for these two numbers here. Uh, we have right there, adjusted funds flow is 109. Free cash flow is 23. So 109 million and 23 million. And it's as simple as that. It's amazing that these companies are, are doing this now where they're putting all the information on page one. Uh, I don't know who's been pushing for this because I haven't really mentioned it, but whoever has uh, a big thank you uh, to you for sure. So the company made $23 million in Q1 after keeping production flat and after all their expenses. We know that. Um, However, that 23 million was made with op operationally and financially. And what I mean by that is that's not, that's not just what the company made, it's what they made on the field plus what they made on derivative contracts, foreign exchange contracts, all kinds of financial tools that, um, that affect the actual cash flow generation of the company. So what we wanna find out is what does the company actually make on an operational level? And we want to know this because the hedging and the contracts are all temporary. They change from quarter to quarter. They change from year to year. It's not really consistent. So we'll take the impact of it out and then we'll put it back in what the actual future forecasted impact is because the Q1 hedging impact is not gonna be the same as Q2 or Q3 or Q4. So we wanna take it out of the equation. And usually that's also in the MDNA. Um, it's known as realized derivatives, realized uh, risk management, all sorts of things. Sometimes we gotta go and find it. Um, so right here, realized gains slash losses on derivative, derivatives, $10.5 million is what they lost in um, three months ended. Always make sure you're using the latest quarter of results. So Q1 would be three months ended, March 31st, you know, $10.5 million. So because it's a loss, I'm gonna put it in as a negative. The description here, you know, there's some descriptions as to what to put in, uh, in case you're running through this and, and um, not really understanding what I'm trying to say with the um, with the column A metric. So 10 and a half million of loss based on hedging. The actual free cash flow operationally that the company generated in Q1, $34 million. So easy as that. Um, we will adjust this once I go through here a bit and I'll, I'll share why, but I'm gonna leave it as is for now until I go through the rest of the boxes here. So. The next thing we need is, okay, so Advantage generated $34 million of free cash flow without hedging in Q1, but that was at a certain pricing. That was at a certain WTI price, certain NGL price, certain ACO price. Those prices are not gonna stay the same. They, they change every day. They change within the day. So <clears throat> we need to know they made the $34 million at what price? So we're gonna be looking for the last quarter pricing of WTI. And usually that's found in a benchmark, um, benchmark pricing. So I'll just control F into benchmark and we get our average benchmark prices here. So liquids, WTI right there, 9438. Um, I'm gonna take that exact number and put it in there as our last quarter. WCS would be for heavy oil. Advantage doesn't produce heavy oil. I'm gonna leave it blank. The NGL pricing last quarter. So um, right there, NGLs, they got 64.58 Canadian. We need to convert that to US dollars right there, USD. So 64.58, I'm gonna divide that by the exchange rate and we get $50. Um, the last quarter's gas pricing. I like to use ACO daily, so 474. Um, I'm gonna put that in there. And that's it, we're done. So 
if you have the other version of the spreadsheet that doesn't auto calculate the WTI pricing, basically what we're doing is we're comparing the last quarter's pricing to the strip pricing. Strip pricing meaning what is the average price of a barrel of oil for the next 12 months? Because this spreadsheet calculates a next 12 months metric, we we take the strip pricing as the next 12 months. So if I sold a barrel every month for the next 12 months, what is the price that I'm gonna get for it right now, today? Um, is that the most accurate way to forecast oil price? No, but it's what we have. The company can physically enter contracts today to get this pricing for their oil if they wanted. If they were to lock in contracts for the next 12 months, they can actually guarantee themselves this pricing, um, which is known as hedging. So <clears throat> it's not the best, but it's all we have right now. So it's what we're gonna go with. If you think WTI is gonna average 150 next year, in the next 12 months, you can put 150 in there. The spreadsheet will adjust accordingly. So that's what I mean by it being very flexible um, and open to customization. So how do we get the strip price? Just so people know, there's a, there's a website called rbcrichardsonbar.com. It gives you the 12 month strip right here. Uh, it, if you wanna calculate next 24 months, you can use a 24 month strip. Um, there's other ways to calculate this manually that I speak about in my previous sessions. So please have a look at that if you want more information as to exactly where this number comes from. Um, so we have that in there. We have the WCS strip in there, and then we have the NGL strip in there. Natural gas liquids, again, if you go to RBC, Richardson Bar, it's not an exact science, but right here we have a rough NGL price, um, dollar per barrel US. It's in Texas, so it's not 100% accurate, but again, it's the best we have. Um, I'm gonna put 55 because they, they were already able to get $50 a barrel in Q4 um, and price have gone up in Q2 compared to Q1. So I'm thinking they get better pricing for their NGL. Same thing with gas price. We put in the Q4, the, the Q1 gas price, and then the projected gas price is again taken. If I sold one molecule of gas for the next 12 months, what pricing am I gonna get? And that's the pricing there. There's a website called gasalberta.com where you can calculate this manually. And for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through it, but again, the previous sessions have all this um, in it. So that's it, we're done. We get our numbers here. Uh, the spreadsheet calculates all this for us. So we just have to understand what it's telling us. So the first one, annualized last quarter's free cash flow. That tells us if we take last quarter's free cash flow, um, unhedged, we annualize it, and then we adjust for the gas price changing, these are the numbers we get. If we convert that to a free cash flow yield, meaning how much free cash flow does the company generate as a percentage of its enterprise value? That's the free cash flow yield that the spreadsheet is calculating here for us. So at $100 WTI and strip gas pricing, about 13.8%. So what does that number tell us though? That number tells us that if the company is happy with their debt metrics, if they're happy with their capital program, if they're happy with their um, acquisitions, et cetera, they can pay a 13.8% dividend right now. That's exactly what that's telling us. Um, so <clears throat> the, the question becomes, how do we value these companies? The way that I value them is on a, is that I'm expecting a 12.5% yield. So why 12.5%? Because as these companies have deleveraged over the last couple of years, they've spent their capital, they've got their production back, they have basically done um, a lot of the acquisitions that they wanted to do, they're in a pretty good shape to now start returning cash back to shareholders. And a 12.5% yield gives me either a 12.5% dividend or it gives me a 
let's say 6% dividend along with a 5% share buyback, and then another one or 2% for little acquisitions here and there. So I like the 12.5%. Um, I'm not saying that's the way that it should be. I'm saying that's the way I think it, it should be. And my opinion is that in the next year, let's say year to 18 months, I think we do go back to free cash flow um, at 12.5% at yields, like normalizing to that, just given where supply demand is going, where the valuations are going. Again, you're welcome to use your own number. Um, I just use 12.5%. So how do we value the company based on 12.5%? So if I'm saying I want a 12.5% yield, it means I want the entire value of the company back to me in eight years. 12.5% times eight is one, so 100%. So over eight years, I want the entire value of the company back. So we multiply the free cash flow annualized um, the calculated number times eight. So this number right here, multiplied by eight, gets us the total value of the company. Then we subtract debt from that to get our value for the shares, our, our fair value for the shares, which ends up, again, at different WTI prices, the spreadsheet calculates it um, for us. So for anyone on the Twitter, I know you guys wanted me to say these numbers out. So um, at $9 oil, <clears throat> excuse me, $90 oil, it's about $10.38. At $120 oil, it's $12.50 a share. But these numbers are inherently wrong for any company that's a gas-focused company. And, and the reason for that is <clears throat> a lot of the gas companies spend way more of their capital in Q1 than in any other quarter of the year. So because of the winter drilling season in Canada, because of the way the budgets are set up and the land and the geology around everything, companies that are focused on gas will spend a lot more money in Q1 than in the rest of the quarters. So what that means is the, the free cash flow is going to be unreasonably low if we use Q1 numbers. So how do we adjust this? Basically, I'm gonna to go to their PowerPoint um, and look at their net capital for the year. So for the year, including growth, including growth, the midpoint of their capital is around $185 million is what they're projecting to spend. So $185 million per year is about $45 million a quarter is what they should have spent. What did they actually spend? Uh, spend? They spent 86 million, so almost double than what their projected you know, rough spend should be per quarter. So I'm gonna adjust for that. And the way I'm gonna adjust for it is, is basically simple. I'm gonna take 185, I'm gonna divide that by four, so 46 million roughly. And I'm gonna adjust my free cash flow number to be adjusted funds flow minus that 46 of estimated capital um, that should have been spent. So we adjust for that and we get way better numbers that actually make sense here. Um, because the reason I do this, just so I can explain this better, is if we just use Q1 numbers on free cash flow, we're going to get an unreasonably low free cash flow. And if we keep using that same free cash flow number for the next 12 months, our free cash flow yield is going to look artificially low because the company is not going to spend $86 million in capital for four quarters in a row. They're going to spend 86 in Q1, which is our CapEx heavy quarter, and then maybe spend 30, 30, 30 for the next uh, th <clears throat> three quarters, 35, you know, 30, 35, somewhere in there. So our Q1 free cash flow is going to look very low. And then our Q2, Q3, Q4 free cash flow are going to be artificially inflated based on the way these companies report results. So if we want to get a real idea of what this company is doing, we have to adjust for this capital um, change within the year. So that's exactly what I've done. Um, again, 109 minus the 46, 46 being the rough 
estimated capital that they should have spent um, on a yearly yearly basis divided by four. Um, so yeah, we have our numbers again, based on the adjustment we have at $90 oil and strip gas, we have 17.13 as our fair share price at $120 oil, it's 19.24. So about a 70 to 90% increase, depending on where, where the oil price is projected to be in, uh, in your opinion. So um, yeah, the spreadsheet calculates everything for you. It's just about understanding what it's putting out. There's another method that people maybe like to use, which is a very conservative method, um, where we, instead of free cash flow, we take adjusted funds flow and we just multiply it by four. So we put a four multiple on effectively cash flow. Um, a lot of companies right now are probably trading at two and a half, three times cash flow. Four times is probably conservative, given that we used to trade at five to seven times cash flow. But, you know, four is a number. You know, the four multiple is a number that if a company is trading below four times cash flow, you know, I'm definitely thinking, okay, this is definitely undervalued here. Then we look at the free cash flow, we look at the upside possible, and I'll run this valuation on my 57 or 58 companies, and I'll pick the top five, top seven, top 10, and then do, do, do deeper due diligence on them. And um, you know, try to really understand this company. Is there something I'm missing? Is there something that's changing? Any inflection points, any well results, anything I can see that really um, make it worth more um, you know, compared to its peers. So yeah, that's basically it. That's done. Now what we're gonna do, and a lot of people just stop here. They say, okay, this is good enough. I'm investing for the long, long, long term. And I'm not worried about hedging. I'm not worried about anything. So I'm just going to leave it as is. Fair enough. For me, some of my investments can be more shorter term, medium term. So we're going to go ahead and put the actual impact of the hedging in here. And um, mostly you can find it in the corporate presentations. So if we just scroll down right here, we see advantages, gas hedging. We see the oil hedging. Um, you know, I, you will need some information as to how these hedges work and what number actually to put in on the hedges. But I'm gonna leave that be to the powers of Google. And, um, you know, put in the pre-filled information I have here on the hedging, basically um, on the oil hedging. On the oil hedging, we have 750 barrels in the next quarter. So if we go back here, that's exactly what we see for Q2, 750 barrels. I've averaged out these prices based on what kind of contract it is and what price the company is actually going to be getting. The next two quarters are 500 barrels. You know, that's exactly what I put in. If you run the numbers, this is exactly what you will end up end up with. Um, I'm going to do the same for the gas hedges. Just copy it. Um, and again, it's just simple averaging to figure out how these hedges work. Um, you know, the price and the volume, that's basically all we're putting in here, following quarter pricing and the MCF hedged taken right off here um, and, the, and the contract that they're, that they're giving us. And some of these contracts are not gonna be very clear in the corporate presentation. So we might have to go into the Q1 report and they tell you exactly the contract and one can kind of go through that a little bit better. But again, the spreadsheet calculates everything for you here. The hedging impact of the gas, the hedging impact of the oil, we put that back into the calculation. And the last thing we need is the production growth. So because, because uh, Advantage is spending a lot of money on production growth, as it shows right to, to here. So liquids focus growth capital. We need to adjust for the growth that the company is gonna be giving us. So the production they say is going to be between 52 and 55,000 for the year. We'll take the midpoint 53.5 and I'm gonna put that in there. So they made 52,946 in Q1. 
we think they're going to make 53.5 for the year. So roughly 700 BOEs, let's say, if we average it out for the year, additionally, um, gives us an average of 53.5 for the year. So 700 BOEs at what net back? Well, we'll see what net back they got for Q1. And if we go here, their operating net back was about $25 a BOE. That's exactly the number I'm gonna jam in there. Um, the capital again, 185, we're gonna put that in there. And that's that. This is our free cash flow times eight model, fair share prices um, adjusted for hedging, adjusted for production growth. And then we put our capital program in and we get our projected free cash flow yields into the future for the next 12 months. And this is exactly what goes into the price target spreadsheet on the website. The, um, the other thing I wanna say is, again, it's, the spreadsheet is fully flexible. If you wanna use a free cash flow times six, you know, just go in here and we adjust the formula. Instead of being times eight, we put times six. So in the future, like I'm still working on this, it's, it's getting to be a little bit harder to, to jam a lot of stuff into here, but I do wanna have tables that show free cash flow times four, times six, times eight, and times 10, just so we can compare different companies and how they end up um, using different multiples. Because I have gotten a lot of pushback on the free cash flow times eight, and a lot of people doubting if we're gonna get there, time will tell, time will tell. I think. I think we do end up getting there in the next 12 to 18 months. I do think we get there, but um, that's up to each, each person's own opinion on whether the markets are gonna reward the, the free cash flow generation coming out of these companies. Um, great, so any questions on this before I go into some of the other um, insights into Advantage? Anything on the chat? No. Oops. Uh, okay. So we'll share some of the other stuff about Advantage that I've been kind of noticing. So the one thing that I kind of mentioned is their capital expenditures include growth. And the way these unconventional wells work is that sometimes money you spend this year doesn't get reflected in the production for this year because there's a big gap between drilling and then completions, putting the wells on production, doing the cleanup, and then, and then having them go full-time into a processing facility. There could be up to nine months, 12 months of, of delay in it. So when I look at pure play Montney companies that are talking about growth capital, I need to keep in mind that these 14 wells that they're talking about may not be reflected properly in the growth number that they're giving me. So because that number is a 2022 production, it, it may not be reflected in there. How can we adjust for that? That's gonna be, again, a subjective number. So you know, if I think, okay, in 2023, the money they spent in 2022 is gonna increase production by another 2000 BOEs. All I do is I go back to my production growth and I put that in there and the numbers will adjust accordingly. So this is something I'm seeing more and more in Monty producers where they are growing, but the growth spend doesn't add up to the production growth they're telling me. Like, so they only need 75 million to sustain and they're spending more than that on growth, yet the production only grows like 8% or 10%. It doesn't, it doesn't really add up. And the reason for that is because a lot of this growth spend is going to show up in 2023 production as opposed to 2022 production. Um, okay, so there's a question here. How are you arriving at the cost of capital? Um, I'm not sure I really understand it, but, but they give us the capital expenditures that they're spending. Um, is that gonna be 100% correct? No but it's really the best that we have to work with based on what the company's projecting. Can it change throughout the year? Yes. And that's why I do these every quarter and I adjust accordingly based on everything going on. 
So, okay. What is your timeline for LNG startup? So I would say early 2025 is kind of what I have in mind, but the supply deals and the setting up for the, the supply and the li liquefaction probably at least 18 months before it opens up is when the companies will want some sort of firm supply deals and pricing, et cetera. So mid 2023, I'm expecting a lot of these companies to be bought out in the next 12 months, 12 to 18 months, they'll be gone. Um, unless they themselves can become an acquirer and start buying out companies and, and growing that way. So, okay, the other thing on advantage is their processing revenue. So a lot of gas focused companies, we need to be mindful that, that they, have to, they have to process the gas. This is not oil, which you can truck, you can put it on a rail cars, you can store it in tanks. Gas has to be processed using compressors, using um, strip the NGLs out of them, et cetera. So a lot of gas focused companies are paying a lot of processing fees. Advantage is in the other position where they're actually getting processing revenue because they own a bunch of gas plants. So not only do they process their own gas for pretty much free, they get processing revenue from other companies that are using their gas plants. So a really solid business model. Any companies that are going to make it, if you look back five years, seven years, 10 years, the companies that went bankrupt, a lot of it had to do also with the fact that they were paying these processing fees. They didn't own their pipelines. They didn't own their gas plants. Um, so for someone looking for a safer company, I think you know this is a great place to be. They own their own revenue, um, processing revenue. And look at their operating cost, $2.45 a BOE. Just amazing. And part of that is because, again, they're not paying for processing. They're not paying for uh, transportation. In fact, they're getting money for processing and transportation. So, um, okay. Do, do, do. So there's some questions here. So um, any viewers on I3? So I'll talk about I3 here at the end once we're done all three valuations, but still holding great, great company. Um, what is the weighted average cost of capital you're using to discount the cash flows? I'm not, I'm not using any number, it's, it's zero. Um, again, why, why am I using zero? I don't, I don't really have a good answer for you. That's just the way that I value these companies. I don't, I don't think the whole 10% discount model is a very valid way of doing things. It's just people just throw 10% discount into everything and think that, that that's the right way. Well, you know, if you think that's the right way, for, for sure, feel free to use it. For me, it's a growing commodity. It's one that's gonna be in high demand going forward. We don't have unlimited amounts of gas and oil. So I'm gonna put a 0% discount on it. And I'll actually share some more as to why I think this way when I talk about crew energy, because this specifically got brought up. Um, and I just think the 10% discount model on everything is just lazy. It's, it, it's not putting in the right work as to why that 10% discount is being used. Um, so, and it's, it's especially interesting because if we talk about inflation and commodities really should be going up with the price of inflation. So technically you shouldn't even have to discount them to begin with. But again, I'm not a macroeconomist and I don't really think about these things as much. Um, so I'll wait to share my, my kind of opinion on this. Um, the next thing I've talked about this with other money players is the stacked pay. So something that, that gets ignored a lot is that if a company has X amount of acres of land holdings, they may actually have two or three or four times that in terms of the actual pay available underground. And the reason for that is the Montney has the upper Montney, they have the lower Montney and the middle Montney, all of which have possibly multiple oil and gas extraction zones. So you can drill a well in one area and have it access three or four or five different zones um, or drill five different wells in that same quote unquote acreage that they hold. So we see here in, in Glacier, which is Advantage's biggest property, where they have this monster gas plant, um, they actually have five zones that they can, they can possibly target. 
um, you know, the Monty, the upper Monty, and then four, four middle Monty's. Um, they haven't targeted the lower Monty yet, but possibly in the future. So this is something I keep in mind with, with any unconventional play. We have the Permian, which has the wolf cap, the strawberry, you know, they have multiple target zones. It's the same in the Monty and, and some of them are more productive than others. So it's important to realize that 40,000 acres in the Montney means something way different than 40,000 acres in the Cardium or 40,000 acres in the Bakken. It means something totally different um, and important to keep that in mind. The wells themselves. So we have type curves on Glacier, Valhalla, Wembley. The internal rates of return are over 200% for all four. The payouts are less than eight months for all four. And this is at $3.90 ACO, Canadian. Yeah, Canadian, I believe. ACO strip is currently over six bucks Canadian. So we look at how these rates of return ramp up as the price of ACO goes up. So from $3.50 to $4 ACO, the rate of return on the glacier well went from 275% to about 375% in just 50 cents change in ACO. Now let's, let's take in the, the reality that ACO is not at four bucks, it's at six bucks. And possibly one could make a case it's at $7 when we look at the day-to-day the -day pricing. So what does the rate of return become on these wells? Seven, eight, 900% rates of return? That's just crazy. Um, some of these gas wells, how, how productive and how, um, how economic they have become at these sorts of gas pricing. So just keep that in mind. Some of these gas companies, we ignore them because, oh, the gas doesn't make any money. It's the condensate and the oils and their oil is not rich enough, blah, blah, blah. The whole thing changes when ACO is at five, six, seven dollars. Um, so, you know, if, if Advantage really wanted, they could say, look, we can grow our production by 30, 40, 50% in the next year. If we just have enough money to jam back, you know, they have the inventory. Are they going to go that way? I, I don't know, but they could. They could take advantage of these higher gas pricing, especially if gas pricing continues to go higher and uh, shows no sign of stopping. The other thing I want to talk about is the something that's coming up again more and more often. People using longer lateral lengths, as long as three miles in the Permian, even longer, um, the Montney, the Duvernay, they're using different kinds of propents, different propent loadings, different amounts of stages in the well. And they each manipulate the data so that their wells look like the best wells on their corporate presentations. It, it's always this way. They'll show it per thousand feet, or they'll show it on a overall basis without normalizing for prop end, you know, whatever they need to do to make it work. And this chart is actually a really good chart because they've, they've showed that their peers actually have better wells. You know, the top two wells are their peers, advantages peers. But when we look at gas rate per 100 meters of lateral, which is the way I think all wells should be compared, is normalized for lateral length and normalized for prop and loading, Advantages wells are by far the best gas wells out there. Um, I think this is on the Alberta side of the Monty only, because I know Oventive is hitting monsters in the BC side, but I think on the Alberta side of the Monty, you know, looking, looking really, really good, way stronger wells when we normalize them to per 100 meters of lateral. Um, these white dots is what's showing that. And uh, the gas rates are not too shabby either, you know, doing really good. Some of the wells are having decline issues as we see here, but, um, <coughs> excuse me, on the overall looking very good. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about with Advantage is, and this is something strange that they've been doing. Um, it's really good because what companies are doing, there's, they're signing these like 10 year deals, 15 year deals to supply gas to Eastern Canada, to Chicago, to Washington State, California. They're signing these long-term deals 
which is great because they get clarity. They know they have a market for their gas. If something ends up happening with ACO or NYMEX or whatever, they have these contracts. But these sorts of companies that have made take or pay contracts or fixed contracts to sell gas elsewhere, they may not be targets for LNG Canada acquirers because if they're locked into contracts to sell gas to Chicago and, and, and Toronto and everywhere else, they can't use that as a supply for LNG Canada. So what are they targeting? Are they, are they not wanting to get bought out or are they just giving themselves, giving themselves clarity on gas takeaway capacity? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I am looking forward to possibly connecting with Advantage Management and figuring out what's kind of the goal here. Um, are they setting themselves up to be a target to be acquired or do they actually just want to continue this growth on their own and not be bothered? It's, uh, it's a question probably facing a lot of producers in the, in the modern gas these days. So, yeah, just something to keep in mind. Some companies are not doing this. Some companies are. And what's their, their, what's their strategy going forward? If there's any questions on this, please put them in the chat and we can, we can discuss. Um, for anyone on the Twitter space that would like to watch and, and see the visuals, please go to whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom. There's a Zoom link there um, to check out the visuals. If not, Twitter spaces is uh, just fine. It'll be audio, audio only. Um, and then the, the biggest thing to talk about with Advantage is their entropy that they founded slash own. Basically what entropy is, is it, it goes on to compressors and other processing facilities anywhere. It can go anywhere. And they take the waste heat off engines. They take waste CO2 from all over the place. They scrub it down with a solvent to recover the CO2 and they get carbon credits for the CO2. So they'll actually pay to install the equipment up front. They'll do everything. And all they want in return is the carbon credits that go along with it. So pretty good business model that I think they can convince a lot of producers to add this onto their systems because the producer doesn't have to pay anything. Entropy is the one paying for everything. All they want is the carbon credits in exchange for it. So I've kind of done a bit of research on this and looked into this. At $50 a ton of carbon pricing, it doesn't really make sense. The, the rates of return are not very good. But if you think that the Canadian government is gonna keep ramping up the price of carbon to the $170 a ton by 2030, that's projected. These sorts of projects make a lot of sense to get started today and then just rake in carbon credits for the next, basically forever and into perpetuity. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is if the government doesn't ramp up the price of carbon, if the whole ESG movement dies, if there's any issues with that, what my understanding is is that the Canadian government is actually guaranteeing that even if the price of carbon doesn't go to $170 a ton, they will pay the excess for any projects that are right now being developed or coming online. So when I think about this, there's actually very little risk as to what they're projecting. Like they may not be making money today, but if they have guarantees from the government that they're going to get the difference in carbon pricing, even if it doesn't actually go there, that's a risk-free reward in a way. And again, I'm very early on doing my, my um, research into this, but as soon as I learned about that fact, I got thinking, okay, well, you know, basically the government subsidizing this whole thing and Advantage through Entropy is the one gonna be making all this money um, basically forever because that pricing is going to be guaranteed well into the future. Um, now, I don't know politics. Can the next government come in and change that and take away that? I don't know. But it's great to see, have some clarity around it anyway. The other thing is, 
Brookfield Renewables just put in $300 million into Entropy to advance their projects. So whether or, whether or not we believe in ESG, we believe in carbon, et cetera, it doesn't really matter because I'm looking at things from a strictly investment perspective. If a big name like Brookfield is coming in with an investment, um, can they possibly keep pushing these investments? Can they keep funding entropy, make it the supplier of choice for these CO2 retrieval of compressors in the future? Possibly, for sure. These are big companies that they're partnering up with. Entropy also has probably 10 or 15 or 20 projects with producers already, already signed. So this is not early stage. It's, you know, it's to me a chance to get in possibly to something that's gonna make a lot of money on the whole carbon capture thing. Um, and I'm not really paying anything extra for it because the company already generates the, the cash flows that I'm kind of looking for without the, contrib the contribution of entropy. So a couple sample projects here that they've given us. So tons of CO2, capital, net operating income, you know, is this the break-even carbon pricing and the NPV. So it doesn't really look very good because you're putting $27 million in and you're only getting 32 back on an NPV 10. Um, it doesn't really make sense, but that's at $50 a ton. If we take this to $100 a ton, now this 3.1 of operating income becomes seven, eight, you know, and we put $150 a ton in here, which is not far away if the government does what they wanna do, you know, it's only five, six, seven years away. This thing could be generating, you know, you put 27 million in today, it could be generating in five years, 10, 12, 14, 16 million dollars a year of operating income forever. So one, one more for the future forward thinking people. Um, my investments are more short term, so I don't, short, short to midterm, I don't look five, six, seven years out, but you know, I was talking to a couple of people who are looking for something. They just want to buy oil and leave it for 10 years. You know, possibly a name that I would mention to them. So yeah, that's it. The research on entropy is still evolving. So I'm doing a lot of work on trying to figure out what projects make sense. How much money are they really going to be making here? Um, how fast can they get them on stream? And how much can they really scale? Can they scale this to be on every gas plant in Alberta, in BC? You know, that's huge <clears throat> carbon credit potential in the future. And from my time working in the industry, there's a lot of money to be made on carbon credits and doing things to um, capture methane, capture CO2. A lot of these projects are actually very economically um, make sense going into the future. Maybe not today, but if somebody wants to do it right now, looking into the future, there's a lot of subsidies and, and carbon credits and all this other stuff that can be used to make everything more um, greener, if you will. Perfect, so that's it on Advantage. We'll move on to Crew here, Crew Energy. Um, I know there's a question here on something, so. Why do you think LNG Canada would acquire production rather than sign long-term supply agreements? Um, would contracting it not be lower risk? Yeah, you're right. Like Shell and Petronas and whoever else could just say, you know what, we'll make deals with you to supply gas to us and we will then ship it out through LNG Canada. But the reason I think that's not gonna happen is because the the companies like Shell and LNG Canada Consortium, they don't wanna be dealing with companies making 200 MCF a day or MMCF per day or 300 MMCF per day. They wanna be dealing with companies with 500 MMCF per day plus or even one BCF per day plus, especially as the phase two potentially comes online and gets, uh, gets FID'd and comes online. So they wanna deal with bigger companies and, you know, if we look at 500 MMCF per day, that's roughly 75, 80,000 BOEs in terms of gas. So, you know, companies are getting there, but, but not really. Like they would still need to consolidate 
to be in that range. And if we want to get to one BCF per day, like you would have to add up all these companies combined, like Crew, Kelt, and Advantage, and Birchcliff, maybe then you get to one BCF per day. It's, it's, you know, a lot of these companies are just too small to really matter for a player that big. Um, okay, there's another question here. For nat gas companies, what price do you add to your calculations? Um, so basically the price that's getting put in is, is this projected gas price, strip gas on ACO. And it can be adjusted as you want. Like the number I use is just the rough strip pricing that I have that I was able to automate, but um, any number here really can be used. I think, you know, if we look at, if we just take a lower case scenario on, on advantage, put in $4, the, the upside isn't really quite there, but it's still, it's still undervalued. Um, you know, and, and that's at $4 ACO, which I think is behind us at this point, given where we are in the Canadian, Western Canadian storage is just way too low for us. Um, for us to go back to you know three four dollar echo um, in my opinion right now. Do you think Advantage compares slightly lesser to Birchcliff and Tourmaline? Um, again, that's I I can't answer that question for you. Um, it depends what you're looking for. If you're more constructive on natural gas, you know Birchcliff is an unhedged, almost 100% natural gas producer, whereas Advantage is targeting a little bit more of the liquids rich gas. You know, we see their um, light oil production. It's not really meaningful, but it's, it's there enough that it affects the cash flow. Um, and the tourmaline is just a completely different beast. It's, it's just way bigger, way more going on, and a completely different strategy. So, not really the one that I would compare it to. Um, are there any export bottlenecks for natural gas? It doesn't seem like right now. Uh, the, the world is demanding every single molecule of Canadian gas they can find. And it's going to Washington, it's going to California, it's going to the LNG, it's going to the East Coast. It's, it's ending up in Mexico through the US, it's ending up in Europe through the US. Um, yeah, yeah. They, the natural gas supply demand within Canada has shifted so rapidly. It's almost amazing to see, see that happen um, in real time because it was projected to happen last year, but to happen at this pace is it, just been phenomenal. And I think the US LNG market is, is pulling Canadian market up as well as we go on. Um, right on, okay, so we'll move on to crew here. Um, and yeah, I think with, with the way that, with the way that natural gas pricing has gone, I think there's going to be an added, um, an added benefit to these LNG companies in Canada to, to get their stuff sorted and get the stuff built instead of, you know, dilly dallying around at, because because ACO was $2 or $3 and European gas wasn't really that high. Um, I think now they'll get their, they'll get their gear. Uh, and, uh, oops. And I'll build it out with a little bit more, more pace. Um, okay, so crew energy, same thing, exact same format, exact same spreadsheet, um, just different, different company. And I forgot to say this at the start, but I did send these files out that I'm using here, the corporate presentations and the financial reports to the mailing list. So if anyone thinks you're gonna be attending these seminars, you wanna know more, and you wanna get on the mailing list for these files that I'm using, uh, please shoot me a DM or email and um, I can get you on the, on the mailing list going forward and the Excel file as well. So crew energy, okay, 33. 399 BOEs per day. So I'm going to put that in. Um, production, 33, 399 BOEs per day. We have our condensate, 3926, and NGLs, 2856. And I'm going to add the light oil again into the condensate. So we get four, uh, 
4042, so light oil 4042, NGL 2856. And we're going to calculate the liquids percentage again. We're going to sum these, so 6898. We're going to divide that by the total production, about 21% liquid. So definitely you can see that that crew is more of a liquids focused producer compared to Advantage. Again, is that good or bad? I can't answer that. That's going to be based on your subjective. Um, portfolio construction, shares outstanding. Um, I'm gonna go back up here and again, find the shares outstanding, 151 million. And we have net debt, 392 billion. So 151 million shares, net debt was 392. And look at the crew stock, so 527. Put that in there and annual dividend. They don't pay a dividend, zero. We're gonna look for adjusted funds flow, free cash flow, um, right here, adjusted funds flow, 78 million. And I'm gonna put that in there, 78, oops, 78 million. Free cash flow, we don't, we're not given free cash flow, but basically adjusted funds flow, 78 minus capital, 55, gives us our free cash flow, 23. Um, Hedging impact, same thing. We're looking for the realized um, hedging. Oops. So, okay. I'm going to show a different way to calculate this here. So, um, basically, we have the realized loss on derivatives is $5.16 a BOE. And sometimes we have to calculate this ourselves. So, we're gonna go 516 of BOE multiplied by how many BOEs they made per day. And then there's 90 days in Q1. Then we're gonna divide that by a million. That gives us 15 million loss for hedging in Q1. So again, if the company doesn't give it to you, you take your loss per BOE multiplied by the, by the number of BOEs in the quarter per day, multiplied by the number of days in the quarter, and then you put it in million dollars and you end up it that way. So a lot of these metrics, the company calculates for us and it gives it and they give it to us, but it's nice to understand where that comes from and how it's calculated as well. So, you know, just sharing a different method of, uh, of how I did that. Last quarter's pricing, it's going to be the same for every company, 94.39 there. NGL is going to be roughly $50. And the gas price is going to be 474. Again, the same at, that I picked for advantage. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to be going through these quick because it's the exact same numbers that we use for every for every spreadsheet, roughly. There are some companies that get different pricing for NGLs, like like Whitecap and and Arc Resources, for example. So those ones I would go in and look at the actual NGL pricing. But I know that all these modern producers the smaller ones get kind of $50 a barrel on the on the NGLs. So that's it, we're done. And it took us literally less than five minutes. So we have our free cash flow um, yields, you know, a little bit higher than advantage. We have the fair share prices again, in the ones on Twitter. Um, for the people on Twitter at $90 and strip gas, it's $8.96 a share. At $120 oil strip gas, it's $13.09. Now again, crew is also a gas company. They're spending way more capital in Q1 than they are in the rest of the year. So we're, we're again gonna adjust for this. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna find the, so right here, they spent $55 million in Q1, but what their actual capital, um, let's see if we can find their capital plan here somewhere. Um, so right here, so their net capital expenditures for 2022, the midpoint is $87 million. They spent 55 in Q1. So, you know, what I'm trying to get across is if we just use 55 as the capital in Q1 and calculate our free cash flow according to that, it's completely wrong because 55 times four we're projecting them to spend $220 million in, in this year. 
that's that's definitely not going to happen. They're not going to overrun their budget by 150 percent. That that just doesn't happen. So let's take 90 million. You know, kind of the midpoint here. Divide that by four. 22 and a half. Let's take 23. That should have been the the money they spent on capital in Q1. So 78 minus the 23 of adjusted capital spend. I'll put that in there. And uh, we see really, really solid free cash flow yields with crew, like 35%, 36% at 120 oil strip gas. Um, again, for those on Twitter, at $90 oil strip gas, 1574 is a fair share price. At 120 oil, it's 1988. So about a 4X is what the spreadsheet is telling us. Again, once we adjust for the capital. So, you know, getting to be very interesting. I've, I've talked about crew and why I've been focusing it, on it a little bit more. As the hedges roll off, it becomes more and more of an interesting company. Um, they're obviously generating the free cash flow now that they weren't three or six months ago. The whole excessive capital spending Q1, I think, screws up a lot of people where they don't really adjust it for the actual capital spend. But, you know, everyone is free to use their own methods. And, um, you know, what I'm saying is not gospel by any means. So we're going to go back. We're going to put the hedging in. So, again, I'm not going to go through exactly how to calculate the hedging. It's just simple arithmetic. This much, this many barrels at this pricing, plus this many barrels at this pricing. And you put that in as a, as a rough average in there. Um, same with the gas, we're gonna put that in there. Um, do, do, do. So throw that in there and maybe I'll just share where the hedging is so we know. Do, do, do. Yeah, so right here, so we have our hedging. Um, Again, this is a very poor hedging sheet. They don't tell us the pricing or the volumes or anything. So we are forced to go back into the MDNA and we'll find, we'll find our hedging contracts. Um, if they give that to us. Do, 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 do. And sometimes it's just harder to find these things. They each, each company reports their their Q1 or you know, whatever differently, but right here we have all the contracts. So, you know, basically what I've done, I've, I've added all the contracts that are Q2, I've added all the contracts that are Q3, Q4, average them out, and this is what I end up with. Again, roughly, I'm not gonna get caught up in doing exact calculations on everything, but getting as close as possible. We have the oil, here's the oil contracts, which are exactly what I've put in here. Um, along with the new contracts that they've taken on um, subsequent to March 31st. Again, we have our hedging loss, impact of oil hedges, impact of gas hedges. We see they're losing a lot of money on these gas hedges. Um, again, they have three more quarters of that to go. If you are a mid to long-term investor, you can look further past that. You know, Potentially this could be a really, really solid play and kind of where this is not investment advice. This is what I'm thinking is that Q2 is almost done. They have hedges in Q3 and Q4. After that, the hedges drop off materially and the prices go up. So depends how far out we want to look. Um, so we put the hedging back in. Now we're going to put the production growth back in. So they're saying roughly 30, 32,000 uh, BOEs per day for the year. They did. 33.3 in Q1. So I'm going to, in this case, I'm actually going to subtract production because they spent so much money in Q1 that their production was way higher than it's going to be for the rest of the year. So again, they made 33,400. They're projecting 32,000 midpoint for the year. So I'm going to subtract the 1,400. Um, the net back, the net back on that. Again, I'm going to go back here. You know, operating night back, $29. I'm going to put that in there. And 
you know, the targets change a little bit. So you can see how much impact the hedging is making here. Unhedged, the fair share price at let's say $100 oil and strip gas was $17.12 a share. With the hedges, it's $11.11. So we've gone from a 200% upside, 240% upside to about 110% upside just because of the poor hedging. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> that means that the company this year is just not generating the cash flow that it should because of the hedges. But if someone is looking for a longer term time frame, for a midterm time frame, and we ignore the impact of the hedges because 2023, the hedges are basically completely dropped off. The oil is, there's no oil hedged, and the gas is about a third, one third of what it was hedged at a much higher pricing, you know, potentially one could make a case for, for getting into crew as a 2023 play um, going forward. Capital, we picked 90 as our number. So we see the free cash flow yield unhedged or hedged is 22%, unhedged is 31%. And for anyone that knows my portfolio allocation, my investment style, you know I like front running these things where the hedges are rolling off. Um, Surge and Spartan Delta being two that I added and 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 playing that thesis in a way with the hedges rolling off on June 30th. But it could be getting close to time where I'm looking at companies where the hedges roll off on December 31st and kind of positioning my portfolio um, towards that. Okay, so yeah, I think I answered your question about the hedges on crew. Are the hedges coming off in second half? Yeah, so the, the oil hedges, this is Q2, Q3 and Q4. There's no oil hedges in 2023 so far. And then on the gas side, we have 90, 90 MMCF at roughly 275 for the next three quarters, including Q2. And then into 2023, we only have 30 MMCF hedged at 3.7 um, an MCF. So the hedging situation changes dramatically at the end of Q4. Mm. So the question is, why is this target price so different from the website spreadsheet? Um, so I'll open up my actual crew number here and, and what I've done here. So um, so the actual number that I have on the spreadsheet would be these numbers here. So um, the gas price here, so 1316. What we just did here quickly, 1340. So pretty, pretty close, I would say, off by a couple percent because some of the number might be different. Um, on, on my own spreadsheet, I do do other, other calculations. Like if I think the production growth is being understated, I'll add in more production growth. As they pay off debt, I'll add extra free cash flow here for their interest savings. If I think the operating costs are gonna go up due to inflation, I'll adjust for that. So the, the price target sheet on the White Tundra website is, is not just the simple calculation. It's, there's more baked into it and which will be why there's slight changes um, from, what, from what we do here in this 15 minute calculation. So there's another question here. During the Adelaide Capital, Dale mentioned they always hedge 40% of their production. Yeah, so the one thing that I've been finding more and more is that companies maybe are hedging production, yes. They, they keep hedging 25% or, or 40%, as you mentioned, but they're waiting a lot longer. Like they're, they're waiting much closer to the date and our big backwardation issue in the oil market has kind of gotten solved with the SPR release. So what I'm finding is like Surge, for example, they have barrels hedged in Q2 of 2023 you know, a small amount of barrels to pay the dividend. That's all they have hedged. But the upside on that is $159 Canadian. So 
the longer they wait, the closer it gets to the hedging. And if they time the markets to some extent, and let's say crew had just 40% of their condensate at $160 Canadian, that's probably not the end of the world. There's nothing wrong with that, I think. But if they're hedging in this $70 range or $90 range, these old hedges, those are the ones causing a lot of the issues. Now, you might say, well, WTI is gonna be 200 in Q2 2023, so they're gonna lose a bunch of money. Well, yeah, possibly, yes, Th that could happen. But at $160 Canadian, if, if companies are putting in hedges because they always have or whatever justification they wanna give you, I think that's not too, too bad compared to companies like ARC hedging at $70 and $50 just, just that's, that's the hedges that become unacceptable because they impact cash flow so much, especially because companies are paying royalties on pre-hedge prices. Now, don't forget that companies pay royalties, whether it's 20% or 30% or 40% on pre-hedge prices. So if there's a company that's hedged at $70 a barrel Canadian and they're paying a 30% royalty on $150 Canadian, they just paid $45 in royalty on something they only got 74. Add in operating cost, add in processing fees, transportation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They might actually end up losing money on a barrel with oil prices at $150 Canadian. You know, that's where ARC has ended up. That's why people are so pushing back on their hedging strategy. But I think with, uh, with crew, I think they'll be fine as long as they don't hedge too many barrels and as long as they're not going um, too low on the pricing and of things. Perfect, so I'll talk about some other insights into crew. So um, the stacked pay, I can't stress this enough with the modney producers. The stacked pay is a complete gem. They have four or five or six pay zones in the same area. And it's doubly important because when you have your wells decline, let's say in the Modney A, you can use the same processing facility, the same pipeline, the same surface pad, possibly even the same well. Yeah, possibly, maybe in the future, um, and go into a different zone. You're not having to move compressors around, build pipelines, build surface pads, you know, build all this other stuff. You can go right to your existing pad, right to your existing pipeline, and just jam a new drill into a different zone and produce. It's a very, very cost-effective way of future production as kind of time goes on here. So, um, yeah, yeah, something to remember for sure is the stock pay. And they might find some of these zones are more and more productive as they kind of do their you know, growth cycle and delineate the lands. Some of them might end up being even better acreage. It even says right here, the lower B and C units are essentially undrilled and they have excellent prospectivity, which is a forward looking statement if I've ever seen one, but um, the fact of the matter is it's there. So it could potentially lead to something. The reserve life index. Cruise 2P reserves are 35 years. Um, compared to a lot of other companies we look at that are 15, 18, 20 years, their reserve life is 35 years. And, you know, sets them up as a acquiry target in particular within these names um, for a few reasons. So one, Vermillion just bought La Crata. They paid 477 million for 77,000 acres and 5,000 roughly BOEs of production. Crew has roughly three and a half times the acreage. Again, stacked pay as well. And about six times the production. What would it sell for? I think land value in the Montney is getting huge. It may not be reflected in the valuations yet. And the reason for that is because the valuations between the buyer and the seller are so far off that there haven't been many transactions 
to show the value of the land. But if we ignore production and we look at just acreage, cruise, just cruise acreage is worth $1.6 billion with the, with the associated production with it, the 5,000 for 77,000 acres, roughly 20,000 for 260,000 acres. You know, if we just take that, it's worth 1.6 billion. We bring that back to share price. It's about nine, nine, 10 bucks a share just there. Then we add in the fact that crew actually has more production than what the Vermilion slash Lucrata acquisition tells us um, to use as a proxy. So you add in more value for that. And then we add in the fact that Vermilion's or Cruise land is outside the Blueberry Claim area. So a bunch of their land, and thanks to QE uh, Buble for this, for this chart, but the, a, a lot of their land is outside the Blueberry Claim area. It's not subject to ramp up issues, issues with permits and drilling and all this other stuff. So the land is potentially worth more than the Lacrata land, which we see here, which is completely inside the blueberry claim area. So, you know, we just take a rough number. We have a corresponding transaction as to what's happened and we bring it onto crew and you can see how the value just off this transaction is eight, nine, 10 bucks a share. We add in the extra production. We add in the fact that it's sitting outside the blueberry claim area, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that becomes a subjective measure at that point. Um, the other thing I want to talk about crew is their condensate growth. Crew grew their condensate production from Q4 2021 to Q1 2022 by 51%. There's no other company out there that can tell you they grew their light oil production by 51% in one quarter. Now, the raw barrels, it's only about 1,400 barrels a day, and it's going to decline. But again, the market has not realized this, that the condensate wells that crew is putting out are way more liquids rich than some of their competitors in the area. And the economics on liquids rich gas wells have just become absolutely insane with ACO at $7 and condensate at 140 Canadian. Um, something I'm watching very closely. Can they sustain this condensate rates? Can they mitigate the declines on these wells? Because if they can, and they can actually grow their liquids production while growing gas production, that is a really, really good sign for this company going forward. So watching that closely. Um, the other thing I wanna come back to reserves and the talk about discount rates and cost of capital and all this other stuff. So reserve values. These are the reserve values for cruise reserves at $73 WTI. And I don't know what Sproul or GLJ had for, for ACO, but I want to say 350, let's say 350 is what they had. At a 10% discount rate for 2P reserves, it's worth $2.2 billion. Subtract out debt, that's roughly $12, $13 a share just on reserves. But the way that I'm looking at this, and this is just my opinion, the way I do things is oil and gas reserves, especially natural gas, they don't deserve a 10% discount rate on them. Natural gas is the fuel of the future. It's an undersupply. The demand is basically through the roof everywhere. You know, there's no country that's lowering natural gas demand literally all over the world, it's going up. And we don't really have that many reserves um, you know, out there. So I don't think the 10% discount rate is fair at all. I'm gonna use a 5% discount rate. At a 5% discount rate, the value of the company goes from the 12, $13 a share in reserves to about $21 a share in reserves. Is that a fair way to look at it? There's no fair way to look at it. It's, it, it's my subjective way that I think these companies are gonna be more and more looked at under the reserves calculations as well. Which company can we buy and we can triple production and still have 12 to 14 years of reserves? 
that's what the companies, the acquirers are going to be thinking. They're not thinking, we'll just keep, keep production flat for the next 40 years. I, I don't think that's the way they're thinking. If a Shell or a Petronas or a Carmeline or Arc, whoever ends up buying crew, they're thinking, okay, we can jack up production outside the Blueberry claim area. We can double production and still have that, that production for the next 20 years. And that's assuming they don't discover more reserves as they go on and refill their inventory through all the drilling and delineation. So, you know, I think a, a really good case can be made that we need to start looking at reserves more and more. And for me, I'm looking at reserves at the 5% discount rates, not the 10% discount rates. Um, and the value that I'm seeing in these, some of these gassy, liquids rich Montney players, you know, there's a reason I'm in Arc Resources. There's a reason I'm in Spartan Delta. And I'm, I'm more so looking at these plays because at $7 ACO, they're just getting more and more and more interesting. Um, not just from a cash flow perspective, but the net asset values are just crazy. So I'll leave it at that. Um, the last thing I want to talk about with crew, well, two last things is, the CEO owns roughly 4% of the company. If this information is correct, which I don't really trust TD's, um, TD's information, TD Canada's information, but based on what they're telling me, Dale, the CEO owns 3.3 million shares directly. And then he owns 3.8 million shares indirectly through Matrix Fuel, I think is his company. So you add those up, that's almost 5% of the company that he owns. Um, It's easy to trust a CEO that has 5% of the company that rode the wave all the way from 14 cents or 20 cents, whatever crew got down to all the way up and was buying shares hand over fist the whole way through. Same with John Bruce on the board, was buying shares all day long, basically throughout 2020 and even 2021, I want to say. So it's easy to trust people who put money where their mouth is and, uh, and walk the walk. Um, the other thing, Crew was the first article I ever wrote on, on Seeking Alpha, and um, 24 cents was the price when I published that, and we're sitting at a 1,600% gain on it, and um, I think anyone writing Seeking Alpha articles in, in, in early 2020, you know, May, June, July, can, can have stuff like this they can throw out there because they've all done well, but the point I'm trying to make with this more so is I'm more interested in buying crew today after it's jumped 1600% than I was back then. And, and don't get me wrong, I bought a lot of crew back then too and, and, and made a lot of money off that. But, you know, and Eric Nuttall talks about this a lot where the stocks are higher, yes, big time higher, but the macro is clearer, the gas market is clearer, US shale supply response is clearer. We have a better understanding of demand coming out of COVID. We have a better understanding of of the work from home trends. We have a better understanding of US shale. Everything is just clearer to this oil and gas structural bull market um, that's upon us. So, you know, just wanna throw that out there. Um, I feel very comfortable buying crew uh, if I was to get into it um, up 1600% from the COVID lows. Cool, any questions on crew? So I will move on to uh, Kelt here. Okay. Um, right on. Uh, okay. So for the sake of time, since we're going to be doing the exact same calculations, I'm just going to go to my filled out Kelt sheet and then I'll spend more time on the insights and kind of some of the information I want to share um, apart from the valuation. So Kelt, about 27,000 BOEs. That's after their Inga um divesture to conoco so they're growing pretty fast liquids percentage is one to watch for 37 percent so advantage was nine percent crew is at 21 percent kelt is at 37 percent can crew keep increasing their natural gas or their liquids percentage to 37 percent they're kind of in the same area with kelt other than the charlie lake stuff the other stuff is pretty close to each other. So, you know, it's a proxy where, how high can the liquids production really go 
in a company like Crew, in a company like Advantage. You know, it's a nice thing we have other companies to compare with. Like, um, light oil production, 6,000 barrels a day, NGLs, 4,000, you know, shares outstanding, about 189 million, low debt, very, very low debt, only 35 million of debt. The debt to EV ratio, 0 0.03, basically debt free. Um, the last quarter's adjusted funds flow, 74 million. Free cash flow is only 8 million, even after the adjustment, because this company is in a hyper growth phase. They're spending a lot of money on capital. So just keep that in mind as to, as to kind of what's going on there. Um, strip pricing, same, hedging impacts. I've put in the exchange rate, the, the last quarter's gas price. Everything is the same as the previous two examples. The, the same format, I should say. So we end up with a company that, you know, lower, lower free cash flow yields for sure. Um, it's growing. There's lots happening. They just did the asset sale. It's in kind of this weird mess where they're growing so fast that the free cash flow just isn't there right now. They're jamming that back, basically all of it back in the ground to keep growing. So You know, not, not the same upside based on what the calculation tells us, but we're going to go back and, and add in the growth here. So very low hedging, only um, one quarter's worth of hedging here. The rest, are, I believe, are put options and other sorts of, sorts of stuff that are above market pricing. So we don't want to put hedges in that are above market pricing because that's not... That's not the way these hedges work. If it's a caller and the price is between the caller, they don't get the max price. They get the price within the caller, which would be just whatever price is going, the going price at the time. So I don't put those hedges in. I've added in the production growth here. Uh, 3,600 BOEs is what I think they're going to add. Possibly could be upped here, depending on well results and the growth net back. They have a higher net back than crew and advantage because it's more liquids rich. Basically as simple as that. And we get our fair share of prices. So right now the price is uh, 6.5. We have at $90 oil strip gas, the sheet is telling us 7.25, um, $120 oil strip gas, 11.44. So about a double at $120 oil is what we're targeting here. Um, heavy, heavy capital program. You know, it's a pretty huge capital program this year that Kelt has undertaken and maybe misrepresents the fair share price valuation here. Um, very, very conservative because just because they're in this hyper growth cycle right now and it'll be important to, to adjust for that going forward. So, Yeah, that, that's kind of it on Kelt. I want to spend some time on the on the land itself. So the this is Kelt's land. This is Kelt in red, crew in blue. You can see how Kelt is inside the blueberry zone, but but some of their lands are very contiguous with with crew's lands. Um, you know, you you almost think they're they're very close partners here based on what happens with the rest of Kelt's acreage. And the, the more so the point that I try to also see is if I look at Kelt's results, well results in, in this area, you can get a pretty good idea of what kind of wells crew is gonna be coming out with. And you can almost forecast it better than the type curves that companies put out. A lot of type curves that companies put out are just completely wrong. They, they always seem to beat type curves. They, under promise, over deliver, sometimes by large margins. So if I want to understand what's the real productive capacity of these lands, I can go to the real results from Kelt and kind of figure out, okay, are they sandbagging here? And if, and if so, how much are they sandbagging on the production numbers? So yeah, just interesting stuff here. The, 
this was mentioned by um, Deep Marcellus here on Twitter. Companies are putting in costless callers with $9 floor on NYMEX and $16.40 ceiling. Like this stuff makes no sense when you think about it from a financial perspective. But what the market is telling us is between November, 2022 and March, 2023, the chance of NYMEX going below $9 Canadian is the same as it going over 1640 Canadian. Sounds like a hell of a shortage to me. That's, uh, that's uh, you know, $16.40 and MMBTU for NYMEX. That's $13.07 on the US side for NYMEX. Yeah, you know, sometimes the market tells us what it's expecting. Is the market always correct? No, no way. But we do see that the market is offering us a chance to hedge at these sorts of contracts, which is setting up for it kind of telling us that there's a supply shortage looming here this winter, especially if LNG out of the US keeps ramping up and Europe and Asia need that gas, that's gonna create a shortage within the US and jack up prices and it's gonna come back to Canada and create higher pricing there. Um, I hate hedging, but if every company in Canada with, with gas exposure can hedge 50% of their gas at this sort of contract for the winter, where they have downside protection to nine and they have upside to $16.40, I think I would say that's probably a, a, a pretty prudent thing to do at this point um, is hedge these sorts of contracts. And maybe you just buy the $9 floor. You, you don't even hedge the ceiling. You just buy a $9 floor um, for whatever it costs, 50 cents. And then you're laughing your way to the bank all winter long. You're just, you're just laughing with all the money you're making. So yeah, I think New Vista has some contracts like this as well. And I, I'm pretty sure we're gonna be seeing more of these gas contracts here going forward. Okay, the, the next thing is the reserves. Again, I've been talking about reserves a lot these days because I think as companies get valued on the free cash flow more and more, the reserves is also gonna become more and more a, an issue that people talk about, something that people see, especially these big funds, the Morgan Stanleys and the Black Rocks and the, and the um, Warren Buffetts of the world. They like seeing big reserves. They like seeing big value of oil in the ground apart from the free cash flow valuations. So what do we see here? On 2P reserves, from what Kelt produced, they replaced those reserves by 1,100%. So they produced 7.6 million BOE in the year, but they added reserves of 83 million BOEs for the year. And this is what you will find in a hyper growth company. Because they're testing so many intervals, they're drilling wells all over the place in a lot of their acreage, they get way more benefit for the reserves on these lands than they were getting previously. So not only is the cash flow going up incredibly and the production going up, but the reserves additions are just mind boggling. So I'm not saying growth companies are the place to be. I'm not saying that's what I'm targeting, but I'm saying if you are someone that believes in net asset values being reflected in stock prices as we go on, the, some of these monotony higher growth plays could become very interesting from that standpoint. So let's talk about land. La Prada had 77,000 acres. Crew had 260,000 roughly. Kelt has 346,000 just in the Montney, another 72,000 in the Charlie Lake, which is a very, very prolific formation, very economic, along with Tourmaline and Tamarack Valley being in that area. And apart from that, they have 300,000 other acres of land all across Alberta and all over the place. So 
again, if you're a believer in land values, if you think the value of land will get reflected in the prices, in the acquisitions, in the asset sales, et cetera, Calc has a lot of land. There's no other way to, to really put it. They have a lot of land in all the right spots. Um, Oak, Inga, Flat Rock, um, Charlie Lake. I don't know the, the names of the other places, but uh, right here. So Who's Coupe, Progress, Laglace, Pipestone, Wembley, Stacked Pay. I keep coming back to the Stacked Pay because it's gonna be more and more important as we go on. The, some of the unconventional formations only have one or two stacks. The Montney looks like there, there could potentially be five or, or six zones in certain areas. Very deep, very high net pay zones, very productive zones with high pressure and some with high liquids rich content, which just sounds like money, money, cash. That's all it sounds like to me. So yeah, um, okay. The next thing with Calt is their wells. They actually give us the well results, which is awesome, very transparent. And the reason I bring this up is not because Calt's wells are anything extraordinary. It's for, it's to make a point on the NGL and oil number, the percentage. So we see here, Calt has some wells that are, and the, all these wells are in the same township and same range. They're very close to each other. Some are making 22% oil and NGLs. Some are making 52% oil and NGLs. So despite the recent increase in gas price, natural gas price, we still want wells with higher liquids content because oil just makes more money than gas at this point. I think they don't get even until gas gets to 18, $20 um a gigajoule so you know oil is still making more money we still want higher oil rates and it's so interesting to see such a huge deviation in in liquids rates literally side to side like neighbors neighboring wells have such drastic changes in liquids rates and one to watch for watch for as kel drills new wells are they hitting more of these 40 percent liquids wells or are they hitting more of these 25% liquid wells? What we see here is the wells that started off with high liquids rates are actually maintaining those rates a lot. So this well went from 49% in the last three months to 52% in the last two weeks. The 45% went to 41s. But the wells with low liquids rates already, the 33% and the 35% have declined even further on their oil and NGL rate. So there's two different kinds of wells happening here. One is the high liquids rate wells that are performing really well as the well declines. The other wells are the gassy low liquids wells that are declining very fast on the liquids rates. Based on the way Kelt goes here, which kind of wells they can end up drilling will make a big difference to the cash flows and the production mix of kelt going forward. So why is this important? Because it's not just kelt that this applies to. This applies to any unconventional play. So we talked about crew advantage. You know, if you have the actual well results, we can track them and come to a conclusion, what kind of wells are they drilling? Why is it doubly important? Because the Permian wells, the big growth on the macro side, of oil supply for the last seven, eight, 10 years. If we run the same numbers on the Permian wells, what you will see is that the initial oil and NGL rates are way worse than they were 2016, 2017, 2018. And also they're gassing out a lot faster. So they're unable to maintain their oil and liquids rates. And it's just mostly gas coming out not mostly gas, but the gas rates are much higher than they used to be on the 2017, 2018, you know, et cetera, wells. So with unconventional shales being kind of the big growth driver for the last decade, this will be a macro point going forward as to can these wells actually produce the same amount of oil that they used to, or do they become like a 
um, gas gas wells now with streaks of oil, 22% oil in there, 22% oil and NGL, which, which to me tells me it's only like 10% oil or 14% oil. That's not an oil well, that's a gas well at that point. So on the macro side, this stuff fascinates me, watching companies, watching their gas oil ratios, watching their um, change in gas oil ratios from the first month to the third month to the ninth month, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so just thought I'd throw a little macro point in there. And we talked about crew energy and how much insider ownership they have. Uh, David Wilson, the CEO and president of Kelt, owns about 16%, I think, four, 14 or 16% of the float. And look at the salary in 2021 and bonus, $30,000. That's all he took because everything he has is in the company. Everything is in the company's shares. It's the belief in the growth and his leadership and the company itself and their assets and their acreage, et cetera, that, that he's going to do well here. And that's what he's banking on. And there's nobody who walks the walk more than, than David Wilson here. You know, you could maybe say George Fink, um, you know, some of Pinecliffe shareholders, maybe even Crew Energy could throw in there. But to own 14 to 16% of the float, that, that shows courage, that shows belief, that shows conviction in what you're doing here. And the story may not be clear. Are they growing? Where are they putting the money? How much cash flow are they, are they generating? How are the wells coming out? There's a lot of red, not red flags, but, but gray areas in there. But when the guy at the top of the ship, the captain believes in it this much, you know, possibly could, um, could mean that there's good things on the horizon past all the unknowns. And the last thing I wanna share on Kelt is their production number right now is actually wrong. They have a few wells that are shut in right now because they're doing some sort of geological test, it seems. They, they shut the wells in to let the, I'll, I'll say it word for word, unrecovered frack water from these wells to imbibe into the rock formation. So to me, what this is telling me is they had some sort of issue with the wettability of the rock and the, the frack water was just behaving strangely downhole. I am not a geologist. I'm not going to claim to be a geologist. But these wells have been shut in since January. When they get fired on, maybe, maybe they have been fired on Q2 already. But when these wells get fired on, you're seeing another two wells that come online at, at possibly higher rates than before. And with wells that produce 1,000 BOEs a day, that could be an extra 2,000 BOEs sitting there shut in. And I know from working in the industry that people have been doing all sorts of science experiments with, well, what if we shut this well in after the frack? What if we produce it for three days and then we shut it in, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's all sorts of science going on. And maybe Kelt comes up with something where they find a better way to produce these wells. They find a better way that the frack actually ends up benefiting them way more. So, um, yeah, one to watch for. They say that it's going to be shut in for two to three months. So that puts us at late April, mid-April. Um, so, so looking forward to see how these wells produce after this, this issue, or maybe it's a benefit in disguise. Okay, so that's basically it for the valuation seminar. I'll open it up to questions now on the Zoom. And unfortunately, I won't have time today to take questions on on Twitter or to leave the chat open, but um, yeah, let's let's go to the, the questions on uh, Zoom here first. So what are RSU? So I think RSU means restricted share units where they get they get these this amount of shares if they meet certain targets or they vest two or three or four years in the future. So they're just, there's a share, share options or warrants, I guess is, is what you can see them as. So if I had $20,000 spare, what stock would, would you buy above others on Monday? Um, 
So my portfolio construction is totally different. And I'm, I've been targeting more of the junior companies these days and doing due diligence on them. So I don't think the answer I'm going to give you is going to be representative to what the average investor should be buying. But, um, you know, I'm seeing lots of great names these days. I'll put it this way. There was a, there was a portion there where maybe April, I was kind of thinking, you know what, I'm not really finding any deals, but I'm back now where I'm finding good deals, especially as the Q2 hedges are rolling off. Don't forget, we only have a month left in Q2. So especially as I'm redoing my numbers and taking out the impact of the Q2 hedges, I'm finding lots of, lots of great deals. And you know, as you know, I'm targeting two things, the conventional low decline, heavy oil plays, and then the Montney condensate plus natural gas plays. Those are the two places I think have the highest place to benefit. And as inventories decline, as the macro gets clearer, I become more and more comfortable investing in companies with higher debt and higher decommissioning liabilities. So I'll just throw that out there as well, that the macro does shape my view on what sort of companies I'm comfortable buying. So there's a comment here. Michael Blair had positive comments on crew. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I respect his opinion a lot. And I know he's positive on Spartan Delta. And crew is kind of very similar, just a smaller, smaller Spartan Delta in a way, hitting banger wells. Um, they're ultra rich, ultra rich condensate play. I think they call it ultra reach horizontal wells are actually coming out really, really well. The, the, the condensate production has been over my expectation for sure, and the gas production for that matter. And if I can get an extra two MMCF per well at $7 ACO, great. So there's a question from Vic. How would you compare to the supply chain? I don't think you can compare Huncliffe. Huncliffe is a dry gas play. Like they do have the Pekisco acreage, but they don't have these huge mounting wells. Uh, Pine Cliff is just a small, I don't want to call it small, but it's a steady player producing dry gas with very low decline rates, very strong management, very strong insider ownership, um, more of a long-term play. You know, you just hold it. And if you believe that the price of natural gas is going to stay high, that company is going to do really, really well. On the other hand, these three names we talk about today are more of a growth growth play. So advantage is your lowest growth play. Crew would be maybe second. And then Kelt would be your, your, your hyper growth play. And just depends where one wants to be in that cycle. You know, it's, um, we see that companies that are putting out dividends and, share, and maybe share buybacks are getting rewarded by the market today. But I would say that some of these companies that are growing and maybe acquiring and not paying down debt, but instead of using that debt might get rewarded in the long term. These companies probably end up doing better long term, but it again, it all depends on your investment time frame, your portfolio construction. I unfortunately can't answer that for you, but I do see a very bright future for Canadian natural gas that's becoming clearer as we go, especially because I learned recently that coal inventories are low all over the world. Before I was thinking that as natural gas prices go up, people will fire up coal reactors again, or um, yeah, coal, coal for power generation again. But I recently learned that there is no coal. The, the coal inventories are sitting very low. And countries like Canada, Alberta, they're not gonna let people fire up coal reactors again anyway, despite the price. So sounds bullish to me, but just my opinion. So, okay. Whitecaps NCIB. If they didn't do a, a block purchase on Friday or any sort of purchase, I am gonna be a little bit disappointed because they did double their NCIB in April or March. And I thought that was looking for a big block buy before this one expired. But you know what? I can't really blame them. I, they've been kind of sitting stable there, digesting the acquisitions. 
I know their wells are panning out really good, but they really need to shock the market now. If, if they want to be a top performer in 2022, they need to shock the market. The, the dividend needs to be doubled or they need to come out with a huge substantial issuer buyback. You know, something that, that really jars the, uh, the traders loose, if you will, and um, gets it on its next leg up. So I still think the next leg up is going to be the big zero ESG funds coming in. The zero, not zero ESG, the, the net zero funds coming in who don't want any exposure to oil, but they're, they're forced to have exposure because it's the only sector in the green. And they'll end up buying companies like White Cap, which have the, the carbon sequestration and, and whatnot. And yeah, management, I think, I think management needs to rock the boat here a bit and, and get something going. Or they need to market, market their CO2 net zero thing a lot better. They need to talk about it more. They need to be on, on, on the news networks talking about it, getting people exposed to this. Because 99% of people still think of white cap as dirty oil sands mining. That's the fact. It's only a certain amount of people that know what actually is going on here in, in oil and gas. So, you know, the world is waking up, but we need, we need it to wake up faster if all you're looking for is a share price uh, bounce. I3, yeah. No, really big fan of I3. I think they're doing great. They just expanded their capital program, which I'm on the fence with, but with the wells they're drilling, with the paybacks they're getting, I think it's uh, it's solid. Uh, no, no complaints. And we have the free option on the North Sea drill here. Uh, September, sounds like September. And I think if that hits oil, that's 15, 20, maybe up to 30, 40 cents a share just worth of hitting that North Sea drill uh, because they do have other lands there. And hitting one commercial commercial zone means there's more there. So it almost becomes a growth play at that point in the North Sea as well. So yeah, so Dale has an explanation here on the RSU restricted stock unit. So yeah, basically employee bonuses based on certain targets, yeah. Okay, anything about I3 now that Bybrook has locked us around 0.435? I actually don't know what that means. I'm, I'm assuming that they either have put a floor on the price or a cap on the price. So if you maybe wanna reach out to me or DM me exactly what, what you're talking about, I would appreciate that. ESN earning results, any thoughts? Um, not really, my, my view on service companies is still the same. I, I don't see them making any money. I mean, people are saying, oh, the revenue went up, the EBITDA went up, this went up, that went up. Well, are they actually making money to justify the valuation? And I, I don't really see it. I, I still don't see it, you know, to be honest with you. And then Precision Drilling comes on a Twitter space and says, hey, our rates are already at 30,000 a day. And we think we can only get to 35, 40,000 a day. And I'm thinking, so where's, where's really the upside? Like, I understand that the extra five to 10,000 is all basically free cash flow, but is that enough to move the needle? Like, like PD is already valued at a very, very uh, generous valuation, if you will, based on the free cash flow they, they generate. And then people also forget the service companies have capital cost. They, they can say EBITDA and all this, but they have capital costs. They need to maintain their equipment. They need to maintain their steel. They need to spend money on training, hiring, all kinds of stuff, buying new rigs potentially that people just ignore conveniently in these calculations. You know, just because they haven't bought anything in the last two years or maintained anything doesn't mean you can just extrapolate that for the next two years. These companies are gonna be spending money on maintenance. Trust me on that one. They, they have deferred a lot of maintenance on their, um, maybe not the big companies, but, but some of the smaller ones. So, that's gonna come home to roost here. You can't just keep ignoring maintenance on steel and equipment um, forever. I will say that I'm looking at service companies that are unique. So not, not your drillers, not your service companies, not your coil tube guys. There, there's other parts of the service industry um, that maybe don't get as much attention, but are the ones that are actually making money at the end of everything. So. 
I think there's more to services and I should be careful to not clump all the services into one thing, but the drillers and the service companies that are the, the, the workovers and all this, it, it just doesn't excite me um, at, at this point. Okay. Can they still do well? For sure. But everything becomes an opportunity cost. A lot of these service companies are not marginable. So I would be comparing the, the gain on a margin surge or a margin mag energy versus a non-marginable service company, right? So, so my thoughts are strictly investment. Where can I make the most money? And that may change depending on the way you, you run your portfolio and the way you look at um, margin and options and all that other stuff. Uh, when looking at your price targets, do you focus more on the FCF yields or instead on the upside? I mainly look at the upside. I look at the upside between the target prices and the current price based on, you know, let's say strip minus 10 bucks. That's usually what I'm looking at. If we take the strip price, we subtract $10, where am I? I will then look at the upside based on where I think the macro is going. Not based on what the market's telling me, based on if I think the oil price is gonna be X dollars in 2022 or for the next 12 months, I'll run all the target prices at that and then see which has the most upside there. And then the third component is the hedges dropping off. I'm, I've been having really good luck and really good performance investing three to six months before hedges roll off. Um, material hedges, I should say, when it makes a huge impact, when they roll off and I can front run that by three to six months, I've been having really good luck with that. So I'm gonna continue that strategy going forward. So I look at two or three or four things there and then aggregate them. And usually the, the companies that end up winning usually would have won on a, on a straight free cash flow yield perspective anyway. But it's nice to pick names here and there sometimes where the market just does not realize what's happening with the hedge, hedge situation. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and while I'm on that, I should say there's a lot of companies that are that are putting in 2023 hedges with no upside ceiling. They're just put options that the market does not understand. And I myself got fooled by these because I was just expecting everything to be a costless caller. So yeah, I don't wanna talk about certain names exactly, but, but some of the new additions to my portfolio are ones where the hedging in 2023 has no upside ceiling compared to their 2022 hedges, which are capped with the costless callers. Okay, I, I think on Tuesday in DS space, he asked, how would you set up a brand new 100K energy portfolio? Uh, if I take my portfolio out of the equation and I just got $100,000 for a new portfolio, I would put it all, all $100,000 into either Obsidian, or Surge or Spartan Delta. Though those are probably or Meg, yeah, or Meg Energy. If you think it more longer term, concentrate. Concentration for me is the name of the game. And I would put all hundred thousand dollars into one of those four. Not investment advice, just my opinion. Are you sending this Google Sheet? Um, no. Uh, th this is not public because. There's certain changes I make to my valuations that are not explained unless I was explaining them like this. So I don't share this sheet, but if somebody wants one or two or three companies to compare their numbers to, I'm happy to send those on, um, on email. And I know I'm very behind on my emails. So I apologize for that. And I will be sending the files out as I, as I um, respond here. Uh, in regards to Kelt, well results and macro, could you be more specific? Are you saying wells are not producing as much? No, that's not what I'm saying. Like Kelt's wells are still pretty good wells. I'm just saying going forward, it's important to watch. Can they actually produce these liquids rich 50% oil and NGL wells going forward? Or can they, or are they putting out more of these 26% and 22% NGL wells? Because the economics between these two wells are very different. Like this well, for example, 
it's only 652 BOEs to begin with, and it's 26% oil, N not a good well. But then you have this one that's 1,150 BOEs and 52% oil. I bet you this well is three times as good as this well in terms of payback. So just watching a little more closely as to what kind of wells are coming out. I'm not comparing them to the peers or the top wells. I'm comparing them to themselves and you know, see what comes out here. Um, so C and Q target at 100 drop from 156 to 117. I would have to look, I would have to look at the target here pre-Q1 and post-Q1. But um, I think the higher royalty rates has something to do to do with that. Um, I did make an adjustment to the royalty calculation on oil sands, post payout oil sands. And I also made a change for the operating expenses because what I'm finding is operating expenses are going up. So third, for example, I went up $2 a BOE from Q4 to Q1. And I think that's gonna be the norm, about a 10% increase, at least in operating expenses going forward. So, you know, there's a few changes made that affected the, the upside um, free cash flow. And that's why maybe you're seeing some of the targets have come down and adjusting the model as I go, trying to make it more legit, more, um, more fitting the high end and the low end. But it's, it's sometimes hard to model these things until I actually know what's going on. So, when I start getting Q2 results, I'll see, have the operating, operating expenses gone up even higher? And if they have, I gotta adjust the targets down um, accordingly. And it does make a big difference, like $1.50 a barrel for 365 days on, on your whole production, it does add up um, a significant amount. Uh, any thoughts on Ontario resources? No, I don't, I don't know the US companies, unfortunately. I have gotten lots of emails on Intero, so something must be going on there, but I don't, I think they're a dry gas player if I'm not wrong, but I don't follow that, um, sorry. Um, so they sold 50 million shares for 27 pence. Yeah, yeah, I did see that, you're right, the, uh, the share thing, but I don't think it's a big concern because they still hold a, hold a lot more shares and it's just asset allocation strategy. If, if they bought in i3 at 18 cents and now it's gone 3x or two and a half x, companies need to re rejig their portfolio around to meet maximum requirements and, and minimum share requirements. They can't just be holding stuff forever, especially if it moves up a lot, uh, for sure. Um, you're keeping ARC resources for now, even though the hedge book is, is being criticized. Um, yeah, yeah, I still got ARC resources for now, but if I wake up one day and I see something I can move the entire ARC position into, I will not hesitate. Um, yeah, and it's a big, big part of my portfolio, uh, but I will not hesitate. If I see a deal on something and I can see a one-for-one -one switch, I think Spartan, Del Spartan Delta has run on me a, a little bit, but um, yeah. I will not hesitate to, to switch that out. Right now, it's just fine because it does its, it does its thing. It gives me portfolio uh, confidence, being in margin, having a name like that that's been lagging for so long, that's been so steady relatively anyway. But I, I think it's, it's really affecting my upside performance, having that name in there. Dutch TTF drifting down to E87, e any ver worries? Um, so the NBP price in the UK has actually come down significantly, but I don't think it really matters for this winter. Like, yeah, European storage has gone above the five-year average and all this, but <laughs> the reasoning for that is because 70% of LNG started going to Europe instead of 30%. So what have you done? All you've done is refilled European inventory and you've caused problems in Asia, problems in, in Pakistan, problems in Africa, problems in uh, America. Within America, the price has gone up from three or $4 to $8, right? So it's a global issue. Um, 
and it's not going to be solved. It's it's really not going to be solved. It's if Europe prices come down and American prices keep going up, they're just going to cut off LNG because it's it may not be profitable enough to ship it. And what's going to happen then? European gas gas price is going to go up again. So we're just trying to find our balance here and. I'm not really worried for your Euro European gas pricing or worldwide gas pricing for that matter, um, because as European gas starts coming down, all the um, gas to oil switching that went on in Southeast Asia in Europe is now going to fire back on. And all this, all the aluminum plants and whatnot that were using natural gas are shut down. They're still shut down. So they're going to be brought back online. So there's this floor to pricing that's just going to keep bringing um, pricing back up. Um, Touchstone has a 60% free cash flow yield, but there are no numbers for oil prices. Yeah, so Touchstone is one that, that the model doesn't really do a good job at because it's a growth play. Like they literally only produce 1500 barrels right now. And if they hit one well, that's good offshore or onshore the production could go up three times just with one well. So um, so I think right now with no discovery, it's basically worth zero. And, and that's what the spreadsheet shows you is that at $110 WTI, the existing production is just not good enough to pay the bills. So they need way higher production on their existing barrels if they don't make a discovery. But if they do make a discovery, things change. Um, and the reason the free cash flow yield is so high is because for some reason they've, they've stopped spending money on capital. Like this money, this company should, should be spending a lot more money on exploration, but it seems like they've just stopped. And so the free cash flow yield balloons, but the company itself is just a shell. It's not really doing anything um, at this point. Uh, so I probably wanna end this here in a few minutes, but I see lots of questions rolling in. Um, I realize your goal is to invest in oil and gas companies. Yeah, honestly, Nathan, um, you're really not gonna like my answer, but basically people have been talking about the market breaking and oil and gas stocks falling and the collapse of society and, and all this doom and gloom for the last three months. And what's happened? Tech shares have got absolutely hammered, whereas oil stocks have literally not really done much. They, they are where they were and the price of oil keeps going higher. So they're making more and more money and the free cash flow yields keep going higher. They keep deleveraging. So I see no reason to hold any cash or, or dry powder. Um, what I see on the macro side today is we are still in an undersupply despite Russian barrels on the market still, despite China down one, 1.5, 2 million barrels a day, despite the pricing you know, the shock of higher oil pricing, the higher dollar on the Indian economy, on the Southeast Asian economy, the Chinese economy, you know, people are saying, oh, demand destruction is gonna kill it because price of oil is high and the dollar is high. Well, where's the evidence? I don't see any evidence yet of, of anything like that. So the fact that we're still so strong in terms of oil supply demand, and there's all these tailwinds coming, their summer driving season is coming, Jet fuel demand keeps going up. Um, the world itself just keeps modernizing. And anyone saying we're back to pre-COVID demand, like what, why are you comparing to pre-COVID demand? That's not the number to compare it to. We should be comparing to three to 4 million barrels above pre-COVID demand because that's where I think we end up. So saying we're at pre-COVID demand doesn't mean anything. Um, that's not the right metric to be comparing oil demand too, uh, in my opinion. Um, thoughts on Birchcliff? It's just an unhedged dry gas producer. It, I mean, I don't really like names like that that are very concentrated on one specific commodity. So that's the only reason I'm not in it. Um, I just think there's better free cash flow yields out there that are also offering me upside on the oil and more exploration and land. And I don't think don't think Birchcliff offers um, really offers that at this point to me. And I haven't done a 
super deep dive on Birchcliff, but it's it's just not, you know, it's just not attractive enough to offer me the, the different levers I can pull um, to make money. Um, why Obsidian Spartan Delta over Vermilion? Um, because if someone's coming into the industry brand new right now, uh, I think Ver Vermilion is gonna be very volatile. Vermilion is gonna be up and down. And last Monday, I can't tell you how many calls I took with people who just got into oil and gas and they sold everything already because of last Monday, not, not this Monday, but last Monday's uh, big collapse there. So if somebody's asking me if I have $100,000, where am I putting it? I'm gonna put it in companies which I don't think have this, this much volatility in them. And you know, Vermilion is a low float, it's a tight float, and it's very subjective to all kinds of pricing. Um, Long-term, does it probably still do better? I think so anyway, but you don't wanna expose people to that kind of volatility. Most people just, just can't handle it. Um, that's, that's just the reality of the oil industry. Um, and, and, and talking about new portfolio and getting generalists in, you know, I don't even talk about these names with, with people who are new to the industry. I, I talk about the ARC resources, the MEG energies, the, the stable names with lower downside. Um, when do you update, plan to update Q1? So the price targets sheet, which is based on the 8X FCF model is already updated for Q1. There's only three or four companies left, which I just don't have the data for. They haven't released Q1 or they, their strategy is not clear enough for me to, to start my, my, um, my modeling. Um, okay, I'll take a few more here, holy. Uh, nice, right on. I do appreciate all the questions. Um, any changes in your opinion on Cardinal? Not really, I don't really have any changes. I, I still am not a buyer. I think the markets really likes dividend announcements, but I would be curious to know how many people actually hold a name like Cardinal for a 6% dividend. To me, it's just too risky. You're, you're relying on too much work on the macro and everything going right to be in such a small volatile name for a 6% yield. I, I just don't see the upside here, really. They don't have any cool production projects, any new acreage. I think their reserve life isn't really that great compared to their peers. They have assets scattered all over the place. So again, just my opinion, I think companies with, with big dividend news and free cash flow announcements could be short-term day trading opportunities. Yeah, the market has shown us that. Look at Synovus, look at Suncor, look at, look at Cardinal, look at um, you know, the names that don't release anything get hammered. So short-term trading is different than long-term investment. And I think long-term, the reality will come to, to play as to what's going on. And um, you know, I'm not really a trader. I like the long-term, mid to long-term thesis. And am I still tempted to play some of these names just before they announce a dividend? Yeah, but I don't wanna get caught into something either. So um, yeah, different investment styles, I would say, yeah. Okay. The S&P and Dow dropping is bringing down these names. Um, not, not really, not really. The, the way the NASDAQ and the S&P has gotten absolutely derailed I don't think the oil, oil names have done bad at all, really. And I think I've, I've shared this opinion in the macro outlook session that what does recession really mean? Can anyone here actually describe to me what they mean when they say there's gonna be a recession? Like, are people even understanding what it means or are they just throwing out recession because it spells somehow doom and gloom to the stock market? Like, and, and I'm not trying to target anyone in particular. I just hear, you know, people in my friends and family talking about recession and I'm like, okay, so, so explain to me, what do you think is going to happen in a recession and what's your definition of it? And they just sit there uh, blank. So I would go with trying to understand what you're trying to say first. Um, recession doesn't mean that the stock market is always going to collapse. Recession also doesn't mean that petroleum demand goes down because we could see recession this time with the pent up revenge demand 
can petroleum demand go up in the face of a recession in its official definition with GDP going down for two quarters in a row? I'm looking at oil supply demand. And when that starts to get impacted, I think I can make a view on what recession does. But until then, I don't think it's, it's, it's fair to be mixing up all these terms with, with recession and depression and, and oil demand and the stock market. They're all different things. They do have some correlation, but uh, I just think so many people are just thro throwing out recession as if world oil demand is just gonna collapse. And I don't think that's gonna happen. I, I just don't see it. Um, in fact, the data so far proves that's not the case. So um, yeah, so long answer to a short question, but, and I would like to discuss this in detail with someone who knows better than me, but I think hammering down what recession actually means first has to be, has to be done before we can discuss you know, what's going on with the oil names. Um, do you favor option companies over the non-option companies? Not, not really. I've kind of gone out of, out of options. I don't, I don't see the big upside anymore. Um, so yeah, Paramount, I talked about it recently, shared all my insight and data on that. So Greg, please um, have a look at that, that session. It'll be way more in depth than what I can tell you here right now. Um, any travel adventure stories to share? Um, maybe not for the recording, but, but I did have a great time in Vegas. Met uh, off Twitter, uh, Joe Schmuckatelli and Jeffrey. Um, had a great time in Vegas and now in California here for a bit. And yeah, like I said, got a couple buddies coming in. So we're gonna be doing some more road trips and travel around a bit. And uh, yeah, no complaints. I think, uh, yeah, anyone who's in California or visiting, let me know. I'm down in Huntington Beach, Orange County area. Um, grab beer, steak, champagne, whatever. So yeah. Are you going to have a, a seminar explaining hedging loss? Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, why not? That would actually be interesting. I'll talk about the callers and the three-way options and all that. So June 19th, maybe I'll throw that on the June 19th option seminar. I'll talk about hedging options and, or uh, yeah, because hedging is, is literally buying options. So I'll talk about that more and um, go from there, yeah. So yeah, I'll end it here. Thanks again, everyone that joined. Always appreciate your time. I always appreciate your questions. Um, and, you know, gets me thinking, gets me, gets a brain going. And I always like talking names as well. So we have, um, this will be recorded. This is recorded and will be posted here shortly. Same with the Twitter space. We have freehold royalties on the Twitter space on Tuesday. We have Hemisphere Energy on Wednesday. We have Crescent Point on Thursday. So pretty packed week here. And I'm gonna take a couple of weeks off here um, just with everything going on. And June 11th, I believe, I have the deep dives coming up into two names. Uh, it's gonna be smaller names. It's gonna be kind of like the West Can and Razor due diligence session. So there are a lot of graphs, data, upside in the future and then June 18, I have some other stuff with the overall North American markets. And then, yeah, just kind of keep it going from there. I've, I've made the macro every two months now just because it's so long and I don't really have much new information to share. Um, it's only when I find a few good graphs and good, good latest information. So I'll update that in probably end of June there and um, go from there. Yeah, thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of your weekend, long weekend for those in Canada, and um, look forward to the markets as well. So cheers.